bit of information in those for you guys, a little map and stuff. I mean, something to kind of take home with you and everything. Um, but first things first, I want to uh, thank you guys for coming on this tour today. A, it, I mean, it's really early, so well done for making it this early. Um, but as well, I know this is your free time. I know you guys are on vacation right now. You could be honestly anywhere else using your free time to have fun, to sit on a beach or something like that. You came to a former concentration camp to learn about something that's, it is going to be quite dark, right? Today's not going to be an easy day. It's going to be quite heavy. It is going to be dark, obviously. So for you guys to use your free time to do something like this, I really appreciate it because it's not an easy thing to do, right? Um, I also want to thank you guys because a certain percentage of your ticket sales to Sandman's has actually gone directly to the Saxon Housing Memorial Service to keep it running. So the administrative costs, paying the employees, the repairs that they have to do, you guys have directly helped this place keeping these memories alive, right? Which I think is pretty amazing as well. Um, but you guys have also done something very strange. Um, you followed me 35 kilometers north to a different state in Germany, to a former concentration camp, and I have only told you my name. You guys have no idea who I am. I could be some random weirdo, and you followed me to a former concentration camp, so well done to you guys. Um, luckily for you guys, though, I am not some random weirdo. I am a licensed certified guide at Sachsenhausen and with Sandemans. Um, I do hopefully know what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, my name is Chris. Um, I am from Toronto, from Canada. I am Canadian. Um, you might be wondering why a Canadian guy is giving you a German history tour of a former concentration camp. This stuff, I believe, is just that important. I didn't necessarily come to do this job, but now that I have it, I do find a lot of value in it because we have a lot of modern day parallels to a lot of these things we're seeing today, right? These things have not ended, right? And we'll get into that a bit later. Um, I have been in Berlin now for three years, just over three years, which is... I can't believe I'm saying I planned to come here for one year, but it's been three now. Um, I lived in Ireland for a year before that. I lived in Sweden for a year before that. So I actually haven't really stepped foot in Canada for a long time, uh, much to the chagrin of my parents and my friends. But that's about all I have to say about myself. Um, I do want to make it very clear to everyone here today, though, before you even really get started, you are not going to a concentration camp right now, right? I hope and I think after this tour, you're going to consider yourself very lucky you will never, ever, ever go to a concentration camp, I hope. What we're gonna see today is a memorial site. This is treated as a site of remembrance, it's treated as a site of education, and that's how I'm gonna treat it today. Um, that being said, sometimes after I say this, people ask me, oh, is this a model? Is this a mock-up? Is this kind of, did they rebuild it? No. Pretty much everything we're gonna see today is original. This is where Sachsenhausen was. The barracks, the guard towers, most of what we're gonna see today is gonna be original. I'll point out to you guys what is and what isn't, but you're not going to a concentration camp. This isn't in use, right? I just wanna distinguish, because these definitions are really important when you're talking about these things, right? Um, but that being said, who here, before coming to Berlin or Germany, has ever heard of Sachsenhausen before? A few of you guys, nice. Um, who here has heard of Auschwitz before? Yes, that is usually the case. Auschwitz, I think, is that very prototypical view people have of these concentration camps, of people coming into the train stations hundreds of thousands at a time, being selected on platforms, being sent directly to gas chambers, just killed in mass numbers, right? This was the exception, not the rule. Camps like Auschwitz, Treblinka, Sobibor, um, Kelmno, Mazdanek, these were the exception, not the rule. These are what we would call extermination camps, death camps. Camps that were literally purpose-built for extermination, right? To kill people en masse. These camps, Auschwitz included, were built quite late. 1940 to 41 for Auschwitz, right? Most camps took on this form. There was only ever six extermination camps in Nazi-occupied territory, compared to dozens of concentration camps. And what these camps were focused on was labor. These were labor camps. Now, this isn't to say that there weren't many, many instances of mass death at Sachsenhausen, of extermination, of disease, of violence. This was not a nice place to be. Don't get me wrong, right? The whole idea, however, behind Sachsenhausen is extermination through labor. You're still going to die. They're still going to kill you. But you're going to get every last drop of effort that they can out of you before you collapse, right? Of the 200,000 people that went through Sachsenhausen as a Nazi camp, 35,000 died. That's no small number. Now, you may be wondering what happened to the other 165,000. A lot of them did die as well. However, oftentimes it was more efficient, if you want to say, for the SS, for the Nazis, to take these people to those death camps that were better equipped to kill them en masse, right? Now, this camp itself was built in the summer of 1936. Does anyone know what else was happening in Berlin in 1936, by any chance? These the Berlin Olympics. Yes. Now, the Olympics, I think, typically, quite a nice time in any country's history, I would say, right? 
You kind of have that friendly competition. You kind of forget your past transgressions. We saw the Winter Olympics this year. North and South Korea came together for the first time in decades, right? Usually it's quite a nice time. The eyes of the world are on Berlin at that point. And 35 kilometers north of that, you have 600 prisoners from another concentration camp just west of where we are right now called Eisterwegen, building their own future hell. It's always prisoners building these camps, right? It's free labor, so of course it is, right? Now, these camps, overall, were constantly changing, right? They were constantly in flux, always, always changing based on the needs of the Nazi party at the time. People sometimes think, oh, it only got worse, the violence, the death, the disease. It's actually not the case. It came in waves, right? As late as 1942, Himmler, Heinrich Himmler, the leader of the SS, who had pretty much the final say in these camps, he actually sent out an order to all the commanders of the other concentration camps to increase the food ration for the prisoners. Now, this wasn't because he cared about the well-being of the prisoners. He did, however, want them to live just a little bit longer, just to work a bit harder, right? To last a bit longer, to make more planes, to make more ammunition, to make more tanks, right? In reality, did they actually increase the food ration in Sachsenhausen? Not really. But I'm just trying to illustrate to you guys how these were constantly in flux based on what the Nazis needed at that point, right? Sachsenhausen itself, however, took on many different forms. For our purposes, I'm going to focus on the era of Sachsenhausen 1936, when it was built, until 1945, the Nazi era of this camp. The reason for that is that this was the most deadly era of the camp. Um, a lot of the exhibitions we're going to see today are more focused on the Nazi era. And the harsh reality of it is, I think people are generally more interested in Nazi stuff. I think that's just the truth, honestly. I do want to point out, though, I can't go too far into it because of time constraints. This camp, after it was liberated by Soviet and Polish forces, the Soviets did use this as a concentration camp as well. So from 1945 to 1950, this was a Soviet concentration camp too. And of the 60,000 people that went through the Soviet era of this camp, 12,000 still died. Which again, is not a small number, right? Unfortunately, I don't want to diminish what happened to these people. Obviously, I would love to talk about them. I just can't due to our time constraints, so I am going to focus on the Nazi era, okay? Just so you guys kind of know what's going to happen. Um, right now, what we're going to do, though, guys, is head down Lagerstrasse, Camp Street right here. This is the street that prisons would have been marched down to eventually be brought into the main prison yard of Sachsenhausen. But before I go into what's kind of inside this camp, I want to talk about what's around us first, okay? Um, but any questions so far? Um, by the way, if you guys have any questions about, I mean, about this camp, about any of the camps, about German history, whatever it is, um, let me know. I'm a resource, so use me while you have me. Yeah, you have me for a few hours. So even if you have something totally irrelevant to this tour, I won't be offended if you want a restaurant recommendation, guys. You're, you're here for a reason, so use me. Um, so that being said, let's continue, shall we? As Nazis had, you know, Jewish people or homosexuals or no one can look like this, things like this, so we that. Yeah. And actually, I've, one reason I kind of prefer the nine. We were walking into the camp initially. Um, did anyone else find it strange that there was houses right up against the camp? Kind of weird, right? Those houses were actually built at the same time as Sachsenhausen in 1936. And what these houses are is the SS housing estate. So the SS guards, the SS administrators, the officers are living right next to where they work. Now, again, for our purposes, I'm not going to focus too much on the perpetrators, um, just because I don't want to glorify these men in that way. However, if I don't mention them at all, you are missing half the story, right? These people were part of it. I do want to try to get into their heads a little bit, right? Um, a lot of people, I think, when we talk about the SS, about the Gestapo, about Nazis in general, I think sometimes people kind of make this weird little mental excuse, right? People say, oh, they were sick, they were sadistic, they were mentally ill. This is not the case at all. These people were totally normal, everyday people. And that, to me, is way more terrifying. Because that means, given a certain situation, given a certain environment, we are capable of doing these things, right? I know you're saying, I would never commit these crimes, I would never commit these atrocities. However, you really don't know. Given a certain situation, this is very possible. The average age of a guard at Sachsenhausen was 20. A lot of these guards were 17-year-old kids, 18-year-old kids. People have to make the excuse as well, oh, they were undereducated, they were stupid, they were dull. No, not really. A lot of them had skilled trades, some of them had bachelor's degrees, things like this. They weren't as disenfranchised as we like to think, because that's an excuse, right, for what human beings are capable of doing to each other, I think, right? These people, you have to imagine, let's say you are 18 years old, right? It's 1932, a year before the Nazis have come into power. Actually, you know what, who here has done the free tour, just so I know how much context I have? Yeah? Okay, a few of you guys, cool. Hopefully your guide was talking about how Germany underwent two huge economic crises in the 20s, right? By this point in 1932, about 20% of the German population is totally unemployed, right? One in three working able people doesn't have a job in their own country. So let's say, yeah, maybe you are 18, 19, 20, you haven't had a job for five years, six years, seven years. 
the Nazis come into power and you join the SS. Well, you have a job. That's a huge deal right away. You get a beautiful subsidized house, you get a family, you're part of a culture, and if you join the SS, you are racially superior. You went from maybe nothing to being on top of the world. You are the most elite member of society, right? To join the SS, they check both your grandparents on both sides that they are completely German, 100% through, right? Aryan, as you guys might have heard that word before, right? This is a very easy decision for a lot of these kids to make, right? Just the fact that you have a job is a pretty big deal at this time, right? And the thing is, in these camps, you start with a certain level of violence, right? And you increase it ever so slightly, and you normalize it. And you increase it again, and you normalize it, right? Until after years and after decades, you get things like gas chambers, you get things like the tortures and the disease that we're going to describe a bit later, right? This didn't happen overnight. It was a process to get to this point, right? That being said, I do want to briefly mention what's behind me as well. This massive complex with all these barracks, this isn't part of the actual prison area of the camp. This is the SS training grounds, the actual biggest one on the planet Earth. The vast, vast majority of every SS member is trained right here behind me. There was one other SS training camp just inside of Munich, just outside of Dachau, the first concentration camp. However, the vast majority of every SS guard and administrator officer is trained right behind me here. <coughs> so, given what's around us, just in our immediate perimeter right here, maybe you guys can understand why not one single person ever successfully escaped from Sachsenhausen. Not one. Because think about it. Let's say you get through the prison yard, through the electrified fence, through the razor wire, the guards, the guard towers, the walls themselves, and you go this way. You just ended up in the SS housing estate. Probably not ideal, right? Let's say you make it past the SS housing estate. You're in the town of Oranienburg. Well, then what do you do? Do you knock on someone's door? You're wearing a very conspicuous blue and white striped prison uniform. The people of Oranienburg, the people of Germany, of the world even at this point, are being fed propaganda by the Nazis. The people in these camps are dangerous. They're criminals. They're unwanted members of society. Really, be, be realistic with yourself, please. If someone goes to your door when you're home, knocks on your door wearing those very conspicuous orange prison jumpsuits, are you really going to help that person? Probably not, realistically, right? That's out of the question, I would say. Let's say you make it in this direction. You just ended up in the biggest SS training camp on the planet Earth. Again, probably not ideal. So, you go this way. You're going to be in a forest for a couple kilometers. Um, as a prisoner, completely exposed to the elements. You don't have a hat, you don't have gloves, you don't even have socks, no food, no water, nothing like this. So maybe you make it a couple kilometers east, right? You just ended up in a sub-camp of Sachsenhausen. Like I said on the train platform, right? These camps, what we're seeing today, it wasn't just this main prison yard. Sachsenhausen, on its own, had over 100 sub-camps and satellite camps all around it. This sub-camp over here is called the Klinkerwerk. This is where prisoners were doing back-breaking, heavy manual labor, about 12 to 15 hours a day, and they're basically stockpiling bricks to rebuild Berlin after World War II. The average life expectancy of a prisoner who gets the Klinkerwerk work detail is less than two weeks. That's how heavy this labor was, right? This is basically seen as a death camp within Sachsenhausen, right? So again, probably not ideal. That leaves one last direction, north, pretty much. If you go north, you're going to end up in the industrial yard. That is where the execution trench is, that is where the gallows are to hang prisoners, and that's where the gas chambers are. Not one single person ever successfully escaped Sachsenhausen as a Nazi camp, at the very least. And maybe you guys can understand why, right? Um, any questions so far, though? All right, let's uh, move on. that you're reading, I'm going to talk about it anyway. So, um, I think as with any good story, I want to start at the end. I'm going to start with liberation of Sachsenhausen as a Nazi camp, at least. Now, this camp was liberated on April 22nd to 23rd in 1945 by Soviet and Polish forces. I think people don't mention often enough that the Polish forces were here. That is important to me to mention that the Poles were here, right? Um, that being said, liberation for some was very, very far from liberation for the vast majority of the prisoners here. Because in the just a couple days before that, from April 20th to 21st of 1945, this camp was evacuated by the SS, and about 35,000 prisoners from Sachsenhausen were taken straight north on a death march. Now, these death marches were not unique just to Sachsenhausen. These death marches were actually started as early as September in 1944. And what was happening was as the Eastern and the Western Front are closing in very quickly on Nazi Germany, the SS, the Nazis in general, realized these camps are going to be liberated, right? If we have thousands of prisoners in these camps, they can just go, well, this man was torturing me for the last 9, 10, 12 years, right? This is direct evidence of their crimes. Not only that, but the SS were very good bookkeepers. 
A lot of what we know about these camps has come from very well-kept records by the SS. That being said, some things were destroyed. Obviously, they did try to falsify things. They did, as they're trying to escape, destroy a lot of information. So there are holes in our knowledge. However, they did keep a lot of documents about what they were doing, right? That being said, these prisoners from Sachsenhausen were taken straight north towards the Baltic Sea. Um, honestly, we don't really know why. Again, there are holes in our knowledge, but there's evidence that suggests they're taking straight north towards the Baltics because Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, those concentration camps hadn't been liberated yet. Um, there's some evidence that they wanted to put all 35,000 prisoners of, that, of Sachsenhausen into the Baltic Sea on a boat and just sink the boat, just get rid of them in one fell swoop. I think really the most logical answer is because the Eastern and the Western Front are closing in, North is really the only direction they could have gone, right? The thing is, I'm sure you guys can understand, the name Death March got its name for a pretty obvious reason. A lot of prisoners did not make it through these marches. As a prisoner coming from Sachsenhausen, you are forced to walk, to march, about 20 to 40 kilometers a day. That's two kilometers less than a marathon. Imagine doing that now, as a healthy person, hopefully well-fed, healthy, not diseased, not sick, not exposed to the elements. It'd be excruciating for us, let alone these prisoners wearing wooden clogs, broken toes, shin splints, blisters. It's excruciating for these people just to walk, let alone 20 to 40 kilometers a day. So of course a lot of people just die during the death march from exhaustion, from starvation, from disease, or maybe you trip because you're in such pain, right? Or you fall over, this, the terrain is uneven, right? If you fall, if you trip, do you think that the SS are gonna take you up and carry you with them? You're a useless eater, according to them, right? They're gonna shoot you by the side of the road and leave you dead. This is a very, very common sight for the Allied forces, right? And for these prisoners taking the death march, for that matter, right? And imagine as a prisoner in these columns marching through Germany, through Nazi-occupied territory, and you're hearing shots ringing out to either side of you, right? You know exactly what's going on. That could have been your friend, could have been your father, could have been someone you knew. You know this could be you as well. The thing is, if someone trips in front of you and you trip over them, the SS don't care whose fault it was. They're going to shoot both of you, right? There's no fairness within the SS. Very, very common sight for the Allied forces as they're liberating territory, finding thousands of corpses like this just littered all over occupied territory, right? The thing is, there were some people that were liberated from Sachsenhausen, but I just want to show you the kind of condition they were in down here. Polish and Soviet forces, you had 3,000 prisoners in the medical barracks who were basically too weak to go on the death march, who looked like this. This is from Sachsenhausen. This is what we would call in German a Muslim, which would translate in English to a Muslim. Um, this really has nothing to do with religious beliefs. This is just a colloquial term that prisoners gave to people who looked like this. I think this is sort of our very stereotypical view of a concentration camp victim or survivor, that hyper emaciated figure, um, skeletal, more dead than alive. But these 3,000 people, this is who was left in Sachsenhausen, just because they couldn't go on the death march, they're too weak, right? Despite getting immediate medical attention, immediate food, water from the Soviet and Polish forces, 300 still died. They were just too far gone at that point, right? But again, as a prisoner, when you enter this concentration camp system and you, people, you see people kind of listlessly walking around that look like this, again, you know this is your future. No matter how strong you are, no matter how strong-willed you are, this is your future if you're only being fed about 200 to maybe 400 calories a day. There's nothing you can do to avoid this, right, if that's all you're eating in a day, right? I do, however, want to point something out to you guys as well. Beyond this person right here, does this image strike anyone as strange? Does it, what, what do you guys notice? Actually, I should say that. I'm not trying to trap you or anything, but I do want you to be critical while we're going through here. What do you guys notice about this photo? Someone's smiling at the back. Sorry? Smiling at the back. Yeah, yeah. There's someone smiling, yeah. That is very strange, actually. Anything else? They're all women. Yes. They're women, right? Um, generally speaking, in these camps, women and men were separated. Um, these women are from an all-women's camp called, called Ravensbrück. Um, typically, you would separate the men and the women. However, as about January in 1945, as these death marches are coming in towards Berlin, towards the Rannenberg, right? A lot of people are coming into Sachsenhausen. The population of Sachsenhausen in 1945 pretty much doubles because of these death marches coming in. And about 10% of that population was women. Now, I do want to talk a bit about women in the concentration camp system. They generally, very generally speaking, were treated a bit better if they're actually in the system. Typically, if you're going to an extermination camp as a woman, they are going to kill you right away because they, the Nazis feel like they can't use you to work because you're too weak, because obviously the SS and the Nazis were quite sexist as well as racist. However, in Sachsenhausen, in Ravensbrück, probably you are going to be treated slightly better. 
I don't want to diminish the horrors that these women went through. I'm not trying to trivialize what happened to them. However, because of the kind of sexism inherent in the SS, the women, A, they have their hair. A lot of these men, you couldn't have hair in these concentration camps. They're dressed a little bit better, and the Nazis and the SS just didn't see the women as as much of a threat, just because they were women. Which meant that typically the women aren't going to be getting the back-breaking manual labor that men were doing. Sometimes they would, of course. However, they're probably going to be doing very stereotypical feminine tasks, right? They're going to be sewing uniforms, making flags, working inside. So a lot of people were treated slightly better. Again, I don't want to diminish what happened to them because it was not a nice place to be. A lot of women did die in the concentration camp system. However, I do want to show you guys just how sexist the SS were as well as racist, right? Um, with that, though, I think people often talk or have an idea of the kind of physical torture that was going on in these camps. I don't think it's often enough that people talk about the kind of psychological torture that's going on as well which oftentimes is just as deadly. When we actually go into the main prison yard, you guys are going to see a bit later, you did have electrified fences surrounding this camp as well. A lot of prisoners would actually purposely throw themselves into the electrified fence to kill themselves just to get out of the nightmare, right? Despite the physical torture, but the psychological torture as well. Let's move on down towards the screen building. What we have behind me is essentially the SS officer's mess hall. So this is where the SS guards and the officers and the administrators would come here, they would have their food, and after the shifts, of course, they would get incredibly intoxicated. Now, do you guys think that it was SS working and making drinks and cooking food for other SS members? No. It's prisoners, right? They have tens and thousands of people in this camp right here, and it's free labor. So, of course, it's prisoners making food and making drinks for the SS. The psychological torture of serving your torturers, it would be immense, right? The man who's whipping you and beating you day in and day out and suddenly you have to turn around and smile and give him a drink, pretty awful, right? The thing is, it was specifically Jehovah's Witnesses <coughs> working in the Green Monster, as they called it. The reason that the SS chose Jehovah's Witnesses to work in such close proximity to them is because the SS and the Nazis in general saw Jehovah's Witnesses as pacifists. The reason for that is that due to a Jehovah's Witnesses' religious beliefs, they will never join the military. And they would never sign an oath of loyalty to Hitler, which meant to the SS that the pacifists, right? And actually, the Jehovah's Witnesses were the first ever religious group banned by the Nazis. Long before the Jews or anything like this, it was Jehovah's Witnesses. Actually, they were some of the first prisoner population in any of these camps, right? Because they would never sign an oath of loyalty to Hitler. I was talking to you guys earlier when we were walking in. There was mandatory military service for men in Nazi Germany, right? And if you didn't do that, this is where you end up. There were Jehovah's Witnesses that had a chance out of Sachsenhausen to join the military to sign an oath of loyalty to Hitler, and they would be released. However, because they had those convictions, they never did. Which meant to the Nazis, well, we're not in danger because they're pacifists, right? And to be fair, nothing ever happened in the Green Monster. And think about it. Really, what are you going to do? Who are you going to get poisoned from? Or something like this, right? Where, if you attack an SS guard or something like this in the Green Monster, I guarantee you they're a lot stronger than you at this point. And even if you do manage to injure them or even kill them or something like this, you are not the only one that gets punished. Certainly they're going to torture you for days on end, probably going to kill you, but it's not just you, it's everyone around you too. I'm sure if you guys have read up on North Korea or anything like this, if you escape from North Korea, they put your family two generations back into a labor camp like this, right? It's not just you that suffers the consequences of your actions when you have a dictatorship like this, especially the Nazis, right? So you have to consider, if I fight this guy, if I try to hurt him, I'm probably not going to win, and all my friends, everyone I know in this camp, maybe my family, they might get killed too. Right? The thing is, comparatively speaking, very comparatively speaking, this might have been an okay job to have. By the sheer fact that A, you're right next to the camp. Right? Like I said at the very beginning, most of your daily life as a prisoner is spent outside of this camp in the sub camps, the work details outside, right? Which means you're probably going to march 5, 10, 15 kilometers to your work detail. Especially in the winter, that march just to work every day to and from could be enough to kill you, right? So you're close to the camp, which is a very big deal, and you're inside. Weather, exposure to the elements, frostbite, hypothermia, was a huge problem for these prisoners, as we're going to talk about a bit later. There was one child, actually, who was digging trenches just inside of Sachsenhausen. Um, digging trenches with his bare hands, in the snow, in the winter. They weren't given proper tools, of course. He eventually came back to Sachsenhausen, into the medical facilities. And the only reason I know about this story is because there's a prisoner who survived Sachsenhausen who saw this, who was also in the medical barracks. He watched because this child's fingers were so frostbitten. The SS doctor pulled off this child's fingers with pliers. 
They were so frostbitten, they just came right off. Right? No anesthetic, no nothing. Now, that child did die. I think he was about seven or eight years old, somewhere around there. That child did die, and the reason for his death on his death certificate was old age. That's how little the SS care, especially in the later years, right? Because who are they answering to? The Nazis are the government. They are the police. They are everything, the judiciary system, right? They have no one to answer to. So especially in the later years as people are dying, they're still filling out certificates and, and notifying, right? However, this is choosing at random from a medical journal a list of eight reasons, just at random. So that's how you can have children dying from old age, right? Um, but that being said, do you guys have any questions thus far? All right, let's uh, move on just a bit towards... Um, but what you guys see behind me here, which started basically as a sand pit in 1936, um, very quickly by 1938 become the execution trench behind me right here. So this is where prisoners down this ramp would line up and they'd be shot by firing squad against this wood wall right here. That wooden wall would have been the bullet catcher, right? Um, I can't imagine the fear of someone lining up down this thing, watching your colleagues or your friends or your cohorts getting shot in front of you, and you know you can't escape this fate, right? This is going to be your future no matter what. You can't escape the SS when you're lining up down this ramp, right? But here we have the bullet catcher, that wooden wall with some of the memorials. You can see those plaques behind me as well. Under this roof, though, you would have had a mobile gallows to hang people by the neck, about four people at a time. You'd probably have a trestle or something like this as well. But over on that side, those wooden doors, that would have been the mortuary of Sachsenhausen. This is where they're storing corpses um, and bodies to eventually put them into trucks with no windows, lorries, and send them to Berlin to a dedicated crematorium. Because for a long time, Sachsenhausen didn't have its own crematorium ovens to do something with the bodies, right? to dispose of these bodies. So for a very long time, when they gathered enough corpses, they would put them into trucks and then drive them to Berlin, because Berlin had a crematorium oven that they were using. That's how much the greater society participated in these camps, right? So of course people knew about these places. However, in 1941, one of these trucks that was carrying corpses to Berlin got into a traffic accident and it threw corpses all over the streets. Now this is really really bad when you're trying to convince the people of Berlin, of Germany, of the world even, that these are places of re-education and rehabilitation. When you have corpses literally flying around the streets of Berlin, it's really obvious the state of the people in these camps at that point, right? So after that, a few months later in 1941, Sachsenhausen did get four mobile crematorium ovens, usually around that area right here, that kind of gravel area. They were mobile, so they did move them around where they need them, right? This, however, behind me, this execution trench, isn't really the single biggest instance of extermination in Sachsenhausen. This white structure here, or at least inside of this white structure, is a building called Station Z. Station Z was built in 1942, purpose-built for mass murder and mass extermination. That was the whole point of this building. What we're going to see inside, this white structure, by the way, was built in 2004, so it's actually part of the modern-day memorial. Station Z inside, we are going to see the original foundations of it, right? Um, which is why we can't step on the other side of these barriers right here, right? This is where the gas chambers of Sachsenhausen were. Um, we're probably going to see some of the darkest parts of this tour coming up in a second, right? If you look, though, to these kind of bench, do you guys see those bench-looking things over here on those grass, grassy little areas? They're not benches. Please don't sit or stand on them. Those are tombstones. Those are marking two of the mass graves in Sachsenhausen. So you have Station Z inside this white building right here, purpose-built for mass murder. You have crematorium ovens in there as well. You're burning the bodies, burning them into ashes, and you just bury them right next to it. Already you can tell how easy and efficient Station Z is, even before we've gone inside, right? The original building, the entire building itself, just so you guys know, was destroyed by the GDR, by the East German government, in 1952 to 1953. We have no idea why. The uh, Soviets were not great bookkeepers, unlike the Nazis. However, we will see the original foundation, right? Um, I do want to point out, if you guys are curious about, you've seen maybe some stones and as memorials all around the camp. 
Um, that is a Jewish tradition where, you know, flowers are great to put on graves and tombstones and things like this, but they die, they wilt. Stones are a bit more permanent, so if you go to Jewish cemeteries, you'll see them putting stones instead of flowers, just so you guys know. Um, that being said as well, um, actually I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, um, they didn't often always bury the ashes of these people. Sometimes they would use the ashes and the skull fragments and the bone to repair these pathways. So very probable, unfortunately, some of this dust that's on your shoes is human ash, actually. So we're actually walking on top of these people I've been talking about all day. Um, let's go inside Station Z. We are going to see some of the darkest points.